Sometimes I get the question, if I only focus on one thing for my well-being, what should it be? And this may seem like a hard question, but for me, it's not. I always have the same answer. It's sleep. I'm a passionate advocate for sleep because it's foundational to every part of your well-being. But despite its importance, our society and our workplace culture still favors busyness and sleep deprivation over quality rest and recovery. This is the WorkWell podcast series. Hi, I'm Jen Fisher, Chief Wellbeing Officer for Deloitte, and I'm so pleased to be here with you today to talk about all things well-being. I'm here with Jeff Kahn. He's the co-founder and CEO of Rise Science, a sleep technology company that uses science and data to improve sleep. Jeff, welcome to the show. It is an absolute pleasure to be here and talk about a topic that I am in love with. So thanks for having me. You you and me both. So this is going to be a great conversation. But let's start with you. Tell me how you fell in love with sleep. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it started about 10 years ago back in engineering school and, you know, up late at night, pounding the books and up early in the morning and just exhausted like everyone else was. And you know, I was like, you know, maybe my sleep has something to do with how I feel. And honestly, I, you know, back in 2010, it just wasn't clear yet that this is, I mean, the science was clear, but it wasn't clear yet in the mass market that this was a thing to focus on. And so I started doing sleep science research, you know, reading the academic literature, trying to understand the review articles. And I was trying to find what do I need to do with my sleep so that I feel better? Like, what is it? Do I need like more REM sleep? Do I need more deep sleep? Do I need to be tracking my sleep? Do I need a new mattress? Do I need to take supplements? Like, just lay it on me. What do I need to do? And I just wasn't very satisfied with how far I got there. I just, I, I didn't have a lot of answers for myself. And so I begged my school sleep science department to take me in as an apprentice. Mm -hmm. And it was actually there that I published my first academic paper on taking consumer sleep tracking data and turning that into insights and feedback that you know regular people could use to actually change their behavior. And so that was really, really exciting and all perfectly academic until uh, my school's football team found out about it. And I was at Northwestern, so we were a Big Ten team. And they're like, well, none of our players are sleeping. Can you come help us? And so we translated the, that, that academic work to work with the team. And then one thing led to another, you know, we started getting calls from Alabama and Clemson and the Patriots, you know, name a, a pro or elite level team they wanted to figure out how they could help their players get more sleep. And so that was really where this turned into a business and started to pr be practicing, uh, you know, not just as a sleep scientist, uh, but as, you know, someone who's just trying to help people every day. And, um, and you know, after a number of years doing that, realized uh, how big of an opportunity it could be to, to bring that experience that we had learned with these pro athletes to everyone with a mobile phone. And so that's really what we're doing today. But, you know, along the journey, we've had the chance to, work with, you know, very top Fortune 500 companies on, on um, studies around sleep and cognitive performance, sleep and emotional performance, sleep and physiological performance, uh, teams in the NBA and the NFL. Uh, and so just, you know, happy to be an open book. You know, I think there's so much mythology around sleep these days. Mm -hmm. And so my commitment to you, Jen, and to you, if you're listening to this, is uh, everything that I say, I will try and be good about letting you know whether it's based on, you know, scientific evidence whether it's based on my opinion uh, or, or something else. So um, that, that's hopefully, if there's one thing that you get out of today, uh, you'll, you should just get the scientific evidence base. And, and I think it's uh, important to have that. So let's dig in like right there. Let's talk sure. about the science of sleep. So tell, tell us what the science says and why sleep is so important to human beings. Yeah. So you know, the, the, the first thing, and, and I actually learned this from Mark Rosekind and Mark um, used to lead Stanford sleep research center and, and went on to lead sleep research at NASA and president Obama appointed him to run uh, NHTSA uh, because of his, his expertise and background in, in fatigue. You know, he, he's, we've known each other for many, many years and, and has been a big mentor and coach of mine. And what he shared with me, I just has always stuck. Uh, and, and what he said was, Jeff, sleep is like oxygen. Hmm. If I were to choke you out, every single, you know, you're losing oxygen, every single biological system is going to start shutting down and going into survival mode. He said, sleep is the same way. If you start getting less sleep than you need, 
every single biological system suffers. And so, you know, from there, there's a lot, I think, to learn from that. But I think that the basic principle that we can all take away is that sleep is, you know, essential to how we function. And it, it, if, you know, while there are many important things about how we do function every day and how we are as um, coworkers, how we are as partners, how we are as friends, how we are as parents, uh, you know, how long we live, the, the quality of the limited life that we have on this planet sleep is likely the largest input into that. Hmm. And so I think that part is actually starting to become more well known because of the work of, of folks like Matt Walker and Ariana Huffington and, you know, the work, I, you know, we're talking about sleep now. But I think what's not known is how exactly do you actually get all of these life-giving benefits of sleep, all the things that people already know, um, and so I think that's something that the science has a lot to say on. And, you know, we can definitely go in detail on, I think, what uh, we, we've learned as a scientific community and and how what that actually means for, you know, working and, and living every day. Yeah, I mean, l- let's go there because I, I hear you, right? Sleep is Sleep is like oxygen, but so many people struggle with it. We know it's important, yeah. but I think it's it's Matthew Walker that actually said, our modern society is basically set up to make sure that we fail at getting sleep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how is, how is our society and culture shaped this and, and what can we do about it? Yeah. So, you know, when you look back and, and Matt Walker does such a good job, you know, talking about this, but if you look back over the last you know hundred years, which is sort of the first time we started doing any measurement about public health, you know, sleep measures, But it really started, you know, in earnest, I believe, in like the the early 70s, where we started to survey it a lot more closely. What you see over time is that the the amount of sleep that we've gotten has decreased, uh, and the times at which we get sleep have dramatically changed. And the reason why 100 years is interesting, I guess I'll point out two interesting uh, sort of milestones 100 years ago. One is that's when electric lighting became sort of mass market. That's when most people had electric lighting. And I think if you were to study that trend over time, what you'd see is that not only has electric lighting got more pervasive and more strong, but the electric lights we use are now far more engaging and far closer to, you know, our, our vision systems. And so um, that, is, that is definitely changing our biology. And so specifically, I mean, think about now, you've got a, a screen that you're holding up, you know, six to 12 inches away from your face that is so well designed uh, in terms of the apps that you use, the hardware that you're using, it even glows orange to try and reduce some of the blue light now. I mean, that's what's going on. And so we've really changed, and, and Matt Walker is, deserves the credit for this term of what he calls naturalistic sleep. Yeah. And the idea is that like we've evolved uh, for million, you know, living things have evolved for millions of years with sleep as a foundation. And it is highly evolved and highly complex. And so what we need to do as humans, instead of getting in the way with lighting, that your sleep will be much more naturalistic if you get out of the way, you know, of that. We can talk a lot about more, uh, you know, a lot more about what that means. Um, but I think that's one big overarching trend that is important to pay attention to. So we're, we're you know, going to bed and basically um, sleeping much later than we otherwise would be, you know, left to our own uh, devices. Now, the second trend that I think is actually really fascinating that also gets overlooked, you know, I think today the common thinking is that, you know, sleep is up there with nutrition and fitness and mindfulness, that they're all sort of pillars of wellness. And I actually think this idea is uh, well-intentioned, but wrong. When you look at you know, how, what's actually affecting all of those areas, the way to think about sleep is it's actually this foundational element that you're building a house of wellness uh, and, and high functioning on top of. And so the same cannot be said about any of those other areas. Um, and we can talk more in detail on that. But I, I think it's so important for everyone here that's listening that, you know, if you're going to invest in just one area, you got to start with sleep. Um, and, and so we'll talk about what that means to invest in sleep and how to do that. But, um, you know, one of the things that we've learned and, and to go back to the hundred years point, the first sleep lab ever in the world opened back at the university of Chicago around 1925. So not exactly hundred years, but close. And that was the first lab that started studying human sleep. 
And since then, we've now seen an explosion of, mm. of science done on sleep. And we have more academic papers on sleep than we do physical activity or nutrition, you know, or, or any of those other, you know, mindfulness. And so I think while sleep has been a trend, my opinion is that because the science is so incredibly strong relative to those other areas, and because the effect is so large on how long you live and how well you live, we're just going to start seeing sleep become more and more of an important factor that, that that's, you know, at the basis and foundation of how we, you know, run society. So I'd say that's the second 100 thing. So electric lighting and sleep labs opened 100 years ago. So sleep should be simple, right? Or perhaps it is simple and we're the ones yeah. that kind of get in the way, as you've said. But I also think that there is, like many things in our society, when it, you know, there, there's a lot of different information when it comes to understanding what good quality and good quantity of sleep looks like. Uh, I know you focus a lot on the concept of sleep debt. Um, yep. Can you, can you like, let's simplify it for, for yeah. the listeners, right? Like what, I mean, cause you could track your rim, you could track your deep sleep. You have to get yeah. this percentage. You have to get that percentage, right? I mean, goodness, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Like we have, we have, to your point, we've gotten in the way we've complicated something that comes so natural to us or should come so natural to us as human yes. beings. And so like, what are the basics? Like, what do we need to do and what do we need to know to get good sleep? So it's, it, it, I'm actually going to do the opposite of, uh, of simplify it. I'm going to just give it to you straight as it is in the scientific literature base. And th again, this is an opinion of mine. I think other sci sleep scientists would agree. And I just want to caveat, I am not a sleep scientist. I've published, uh, you know, two papers at this point, <laughs> but I know the science base well. I interface with the scientific community and a lot of the folks in it. And, um, and so I consider myself a sort of, uh, you know, budding amateur, but, but <laughs> definitely I know the literature base, uh, reasonably well at this point. And so there, there's some, you know, I think we all know how important sleep is, you know, how important it is for our cognition, how important it is for our emotion, how it is important for our physiology, anything you can imagine, there's studies showing that sleep affects it. Now, what's not known. And, and I think what's not known, at least, uh, you know, I think widely is how do you get the benefits? This is the same question that I started with 10 years ago. Like, what do I need to do? And so luckily for us, uh, sleep researchers have, have actually figured out what it is. And this is, in my opinion, the most central finding in all of sleep science, sort of like the laws of physics for sleep. And it's something called the two-factor model of sleep and wake regulation. And basically what this theory says is that if you care about how uh, awake and alert you are the next day, uh, how performant you are. There are only two factors that drive that. That's why it's called the two-factor model. Um, the first factor is scientifically known as the sleep homeostat, but what really uh, is, is uh, I think, an easier way to think about it, a better way to think about it is something called, the, is called sleep debt, which is just a measure of how sleep-deprived you are at any given day. Um, and we can talk about how it works, but this is the single most important measure and number when it comes to your sleep and how it affects how you're going to function. We actually have a study that got accepted for publication about a month ago now um, that follows NFL athletes and follows uh, high-performing salespeople. Uh, and, and what it shows is that, and again, not surprising the scientific community, but it's actually sleep debt that is predicting NFL game performance, NBA game performance, You know how many three points you're able to make, how much sales you can make in a, in a month uh, is actually is predicted by your sleep debt, not based on how much sleep you got last night, not based on how you felt when you woke up in the morning. Um, and so that's really, you know, the most important uh, score number measure when it comes to sleep. So the way sleep debt works um, is that we each have a genetic need for sleep. So just like height or eye color, it's all different based on, you know, your, your genetic makeup. And so your sleep need is the same way. The average is slightly over eight hours, around eight hours and 15 minutes with a 35 minute standard deviation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, most of us need somewhere between, you know, let's just call it seven and a half and nine, but it doesn't mean that some nights you need seven and a half and some nights you need nine. It means that you have an actual need you need to get. And every night that you don't get that need, you build up debt. And our research shows you can build up debt that, that affects you over the last 14 days, but there's laboratory research that shows you can build it up over 30 days. Um, and so that's really what matters. And, it, and while last night is certainly the most important night, 
it's not the only night that matters. And, you know, the last 14 nights will affect you. So that's, you know, at a high level how this works. And I'd say there's sort of two exciting, very, very exciting things about this. One is that if you have a terrible night, and we all do, you know, welcome to being human in 2021. <laughs> it's not last night that that matters. Like even for me, last night was actually a pretty, I, I was tossing and turning. I was up thinking about work. I think I got, I ended up getting like maybe seven hours. And my need is actually eight hours and 20 minutes. So, you know, even though last night was pretty fitful for me, I know that I'm going to do just fine today because my sleep debt is two and a half hours. So I've done such a good job over the last 14 days that one night isn't going to have a big effect. And this was super important for the athletes who worked with because they would be worried that, you know, they're, they're about to play in front of millions of people and they need to play well when they get in the game for one play. You know, it's one play that makes the difference between winning or losing. And so they were thinking about it's almost this performance anxiety. It's like, oh, now do I have to like worry about my sleep? It's like, no. If you take care of business for the last two weeks, basically what happens the night before your performance event isn't going to affect you that much. So can you make up sleep debt? So like if one night I get six hours and the next night I get nine. Yes. And, so, and what about napping? Yeah. No, <laughs> I'm a big so, napper. <laughs> so napping is a fantastic way to reduce your sleep debt. Actually, Mark Rose, kind of who I mentioned earlier, he led the the fit, NASA's fatigue countermeasures group mm. for you know for their for uh, astronauts and fighter pilots, and that sounds really you know fancy fatigue countermeasures. What they studied was napping and the optimal ways to nap. Love it. So absolutely, <laughs> napping is uh, a very powerful tool, uh, but there's some things to be aware of that we can definitely spend some time on. So I'd, I'd say you can make it up and. You know, this is a point that I, I will clarify if anyone's listened to sort of Matt Walker talk about this or any of the other podcasts, he'll sometimes say that you can't make up sleep debt. And I think he even talks about it in his book. I think he, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and, um, and, and, and uh, assume that what he meant is that we don't know as a scientific community if you can make up a long-term sleep debt. Like let's say for your entire 20s, you got five hours a night and, you know, you, you, built up all this sleep debt, you just powered through, you felt exhausted the whole time. And then, you know, all of a sudden you make a change in your thirties. Can you make up the, those last 10, 20 years? The question, that question is actually unknown. And what we do know, and what Matt Walker points out is that, again, if you cut your sleep short and you build up sleep debt, that's actually going to put your body into a fight or flight response mode. And that over time is basically linked to, you know, all, many of the major chronic diseases that lead right. to shorter lifespans. So that I, I don't know. And I don't think this, the, I think the scientific, uh, you know, question on that is still out. What we do know is absolutely, if you got six hours one night and then on the weekend you make it up or you take a nap, your short term emotional, cognitive and physiological performance immediately gets better. So that you can absolutely make up. And, you know, it's really empowering. Even if you've been sleeping poorly for the last, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you can change it tonight and get the benefit. Love that. Love that. <laughs> I'm sure that's going to make a lot of people listening feel a lot better. <laughs> yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's like, um, you know, sleep is just like anything else. And I think what makes sleep debt uh, sort of unique, there was um, a, another just famous sleep scientist named Bill Dement, and he was famous uh, for starting Stanford Sleep Research Center, really starting the field of sleep medicine as we know it. And he used to teach a class at Stanford called Sleep and Dreams, one of the most popular undergraduate classes. And the tagline for the class was drowsiness is red alert. And that might sort of be strange, like, why is that the tagline for this class? And it turns out that it is very difficult to be aware of how much sleep debt you're under. Yeah. Our brains basically trick us into thinking we're not that sleepy. And so um, the, the research actually shows that it, it, basically if you were to get four hours of sleep tonight, Jen, you, tomorrow you, your performance would degrade, you know, obviously. You would tell me that you're feeling a little bit more sleepy. If you did that again for day two, that would, the same thing would happen. Your performance would continue to degrade. You'd also subjectively say, yeah, I feel more sleepy. And day three, the same thing would happen. You'd, your performance would degrade. And day three, you'd be like, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely more sleepy. Now, you would, you would report to feeling only slightly sleepy. And basically, if you were to continue that regimen of getting four hours a night of sleep for, you know, from day three to day 14, 
you actually would not report to feeling subjectively any more sleepy <laughs> for the for the next you know almost two weeks. And so it's happened, even though your objective performance, by the way, is just continuing to get worse, you know, an objective performance emotionally, cognitively, physiologically. And so um, it's very hard to be self-aware of how much sleep debt you're under. The, the One of the ways that you can do this for free is, uh, you know, at a high level to know is, are you at all slightly sleepy during the day? If the answer is yes, you have significant sleep debt. And what's exciting about that is you have significant headroom to improve how you're functioning, which is just really, I think, exciting because it's, you know, uh, relative to everything else that you could do in life, like getting more sleep while it can be challenging sometimes is also not that challenging. It's pretty simple, you know, so, and it's free. So it's going to have a massive impact on how you function and feel uh, if you are at all slightly drowsy. Um, But that's one of the reasons that within the Rise app, we just put so much attention on sleep debt. Because it's not some sleep score we made up. It's just a measure that we believe everyone on the planet should know to be able to inform the trade off of, well, how much do I need to sleep tonight? Should I prioritize my sleep tonight? Should I prioritize getting more work done? Should I prioritize hanging out with family? Should I prioritize, you know, staying up watching Netflix till 1 a.m.? You know, what should you prioritize? And without understanding of your own sleep debt, that prioritization gain becomes, you know, almost impossible. So I want to go back to something you said, because, you know, I often hear from people when I'm talking about sleep and, you know, the the recommendation, you said seven and a half to nine hours, you know, other people say seven to nine hours, but I have people tell me I get four to five hours of sleep per night and I've always gotten four to five hours per sleep per night and I do just fine. Yeah. What, yeah. What's your, what's your response to that? Or what does the science say around that? Cause it sounds like we believe we've adapted, but what's going on kind of in our bodies and our brains is not adaptation at all. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, so it's sort of adaptation and evolutionary context, uh, which is that you have evolved to basically your brain is tricking you saying you need to feel okay because you need to survive. And what happens is your uh, all of your fight or flight response starts to activate. So you have huge releases of cortisol, which is the stress hormone, which releases a bunch of blood sugar into the bloodstream which, you know, again, for like, if you need to escape some sort of uh, perilous danger for two, three days, and you know, you're trying to outrun that danger, well, that's a great adaptation to have. Today, it's not so great, because you're going to die early, you're going to have more likelihood of the chronic diseases, and you're going to have a much worse off, you know, daily experience of life, which is sort of all we have anyway. So, um, so that's sort of, uh, you know, high level, what I usually say to that person is very simple. Like after explaining, you know, sleep debt and they understand the importance of sleep and they're like, well, I only need four to five hours. You know, it, I, what I, what I say is like, that might actually be true. Just as there are people that are seven feet tall, you know, it's uh, the, the uh, sleep needs, at least what we know now are normally distributed. And there are such people as short sleepers, but if you are uh, slightly sleepy during the day at all, dr- like at all, any little bit of drowsiness, you have significant sleep deprivation. Usually the question I follow up, if someone's like, oh, I only need four hours, I ask them, well, how how quickly do you fall asleep at night? And they're usually like, oh, I'm a great sleeper. I fall asleep immediately as soon as I put my head on the pillow. Yes, they're exhausted. Like, that's actually the clinical measure of being clinically sleep deprived. Yeah. You know, if you're able to fall asleep in under five minutes when you put your head on the pillow, that tells me that that you have so much more room to improve should you want to improve. And that because of this sort of subjective adaptation that our brain just tries to tell us that it's okay, we end up, uh, you know, telling ourselves that we're just fine. And I think what's so encouraging is that, uh, you know, you, you might have thought that most of your life you're lazy or you're not creative or you're not a hard worker or you don't have willpower or any of these things that you start to bring into your identity. I'm anxious. I get paranoid in meetings, you know, whatever that happens to be. And if your sleep isn't, you know, if your sleep debt basically isn't low, the first place to start instead of, you know, thinking about worrying that you're not good enough is get your sleep debt low mm-hmm. and then see how you feel, then layer in all of these other areas. And, um, and that's just sort of the foundation for, you know, how to build a much better life is it starts with, is my sleep debt reasonably, you know, in control? <laughs> And, and it's fascinating because, um, you know, I, I used to be that person that, you know, only slept four or five hours a night and, and, um, and, and then 
I became that person that sleeps on average, you know, eight and a half hours per night. Yeah. And first of all, it took me a while to get there. You know, you can't just, for whatever reason, I guess, and maybe you can explain this, you can't just go from sleeping, you know, five hours per night to sleeping eight and a half hours. Per oh, night. Yeah. <laughs> um, you have to, you kind of have to work up to that. Right. But you get there, but I will tell you now that I'm that person that sleeps eight and a half hours per night, when I don't sleep well, it, you know, everything else seems to kind of fall apart. My emotional state, my ability yeah. to stay present, my ability to be creative, my ability to control, you know, just like my emotions and, and the way that I, you know, process what's going on around me. Um, you know, just kind of everything, right? The ability, yeah. to certainly exercise, right? So it, it really, like you said, truly is the the foundation. But you know, when I talk to people about sleep or getting more sleep, I you know, I tend to talk to them about really in in everything in the well being space. We talk about micro habits or or micro yep. steps, right? So just getting, if you can just start by getting fifteen minutes more of sleep per night, or and then and then add thirty minutes, and then add you know whatever it is that is kind of you know, where you are to where you want to be, is that. Is that kind of an appropriate approach for anybody that's looking to improve their sleep? Yeah. So, you know, I think uh, I want to get back to that. The short answer is yes. And actually the paper that we published, the the first one that we did was actually taking a tiny habits approach, uh, you know, from BJ Fogg and uh, basically giving people uh, sleep schedules that are known as optimally challenging. Basically, if you're getting five hours a night, It turns out that, you know, going to eight is actually very hard behaviorally to sustain over time. But if you're getting five hours, you can probably get five hours, you know, get to bed instead of at 2 a.m. You could probably get in bed at 145. Yeah. And by having an optimally challenging bedtime, what we found is people are actually sleeping, you know, in many cases, almost up to two hours more a night, you know, Mm -hmm. over time. And so that actually is, uh, you know, at the heart of of behavior and and definitely some fascinating insights we can share there and some things we've learned. Um, and, and I can sort of maybe tie back to the initial question, which is like, you know, how do you, what do we need to do and what do we need to know with sleep? So the first lever is sleep debt. You know, I think we've talked about that and how it works. The second lever is something called the circadian rhythm. And I know a bunch of folks have, have heard about this. When I first heard about it, I thought it was like some weird, you know, voodoo. I, I, I was like, the, we have biological rhythms. Are you kidding me? We have energy peaks of during the day and di- like, what are you talking about? But it turns out we've been studying uh, the, these circadian rhythms for you know even longer than we've been studying just sleep. And the the circadian rhythm, I'll just sort of break down the, even the word. So circa is Latin for around, dian is day. So it's referring to these around the around a day, around twenty four hour biological uh, rhythms that we have. And there's actually a, a, a clock in your brain called the SCN. That is sort of a, think about it as like a master pacemaker that's basically controlling even at a cellular level, how much energy is available to your cells. And so as a result of this, what you're going to feel and what, what, what that sort of means for all of us is that we actually have a time in the morning where we're incredibly groggy. You're supposed to be groggy when you wake up. That's not a, you know, you don't need a better mattress to wake up with your arms raised and a smile on your face. It's pretty normal to feel groggy for about 90 minutes in the morning. You're then going to have a peak of energy. Um, in the morning, you're that that's going to be followed by a dip. It's going to be followed by then a second big peak, which is actually when most athletic world records are broken. Uh, and, and you're sort of at a peak of capacity in terms of all of your performance. Um, and then that's going to then be followed by your, uh, what's called biological night and, and something called a melatonin window. So basically when your brain at night is releasing a lot of natural melatonin and is the sort of optimal time to be sleeping. Um, And so all of these things are happening on a daily basis and actually based on when you go to sleep and when you wake up and when you get light, all of those times are shifting on a daily basis Um, and they can change by as much as an hour per day. And so being able to think about, you know, not just your sleep debt, but also thinking about your day, not just what are you doing, but when are you doing it? When are you doing it in the morning? Are you, you know, having your meditation session at the middle of your morning peak when maybe you should be doing your most creative work? Are you, you know, um, taking care of, ad, you know, administrative tasks during that second evening peak when maybe you should be taking care of your most important personal relationships, you know, after you're done with work? So are you working and working on, you know, an important work project way into your biological night when you are not productive and you're sort of working against the clock, so to speak? You know, 
all of those things are very, very important. And so by being able to be smarter about when you do things, you know, when you sleep, when you do your most important work, when you do your work that's not as high capacity, that's going to also have a massive impact on your day. So um, those two together, if you understand both of them, that's really how you get the, you know, if you want to simplify sleep, that's it. Get your sleep debt down and work according to your circadian peaks and dips. And if you do those things, you're basically getting 95, you know, and this is uh, uh, sort of a just way to think about it. You're getting most of the benefit, you know, 95% of the benefit. Everything else is sort of like small little rocks and small, tiny optimizations. So things like sleep quality, I'll just be a little bit pointy. That doesn't really matter. Things like REM and deep sleep don't really matter. Things like what mattress you're sleeping on doesn't really matter. Um, You know, obviously that stuff does. And there's, you know, we could spend hours on each of those topics, but roughly speaking, don't worry about those things. Worry about is your sleep debt in check and are you working at the right part of your, your circadian rhythm? So this is fascinating. Um, (laughs) So, and I think about kind of the, as we talk about, you know, sleep and the workplace and the workforce and the importance of, you know, well-rested employees, obviously there's been a lot of work done with athletes. Um, You know, I know Matthew Walker talks in his book and, and, you know, about um, certain school systems that have, you know, changed the start time of schools in particularly for teenagers, because I think there's some science that says their circadian rhythm actually shifts or change. But what is like, let's talk about this in the workplace. Like, how does this, you know, how does a a leader and an organization, you know, um, help people design their, their day around, you know, when they are, you know, when they are most creative or most productive, or, you know, I mean, I, I get so excited about the, <laughs> the opportunity to really, you know, maximize the work that we do and the work, you know, the well-being of our workforce by simply helping them understand their sleep debt and their circadian rhythm. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, I'll tell you a story of, of just a really fun one. So, I mean, there's been a lot of work in athletes, it's sort of a lot of work in the military, a lot of work in a lab setting. Um, and there's some work done on sleep in the workplace. And uh, I was at Northwestern. I was working with all of these professional teams. And actually, the, the head of the Kellogg Sales Institute, so Northwestern's business school, found out about this research that we were doing and said, Jeff, you know, sales would be such a great place to measure this with. And there, you know, Kellogg has one of the sort of their, you know, big, well known business school, but they actually study sales as an academic discipline. And he said, would you be willing to partner with me in one of my Fortune 200 sales teams that does, you know, 17 billion in revenue, has 4,000 salespeople, their metrics are really buttoned up, and we'll actually do a randomized controlled trial. And let's, let's look at the impact of like, what does, you know, uh, w- what is the impact of sleep on, on revenue performance? Because, you know, if you back out of like, well, how do you get to revenue performance? Well, it's the salesperson's performance. Well, what's that based on? Okay, well, you know, we know that it's going to be based on, you know, how they do in their calls, how many, you know, are you doing a high enough quality and quantity of sales activities? Well, what's that based on? And as you sort of go down the root cause path, what you find is that it's not better sales tooling, it's actually can we make the salesperson better at being human? And so that if you care about that, then sleep is going to be the biggest lever and input into that. And so in this study um, with this Fortune 200 what we found was that um, by reducing sleep debt the the sales team on average was able to increase their monthly revenue by 14%. And on an individual basis, it didn't affect everyone 14%. Some of the sellers, it affected about 7% a month, but some it was as high as 30%. So, I mean, we're talking about, you know, at, a, at an organization that's doing 16 billion in revenue or 17 billion in revenue, even just a 10% bump. Let's assume that we're wrong by a factor of 10 you know, it's, it's, we're talking, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in revenue increase. You know, you can beat uh, your, the, the, the Wall Street analyst projections of the company by changing your people's sleep habits. So I think when you start to realize just how foundational sleep is for the work we do every day, you know, and that's not even talking about, you know, how that affects morale in the team and leadership in the team and retention and, and you know, and how we treat one another. <laughs> yeah, like we're not even talking about, we're just talking about like, like literally we're talking about revenue, right? So yeah. I think when you then start to think about the, the, the second and third order impacts of a better well-rested, you know, workforce, 
in my opinion, there's, and obviously I'm biased, but there's nothing more important that you can do as a leader. And especially, I, I don't know if you've dug into any of the research on sleep and leadership uh, that that has been done, but just unbelievably fascinating in terms of, you know, as you think about the cascading effects sleep can have, uh, yeah. sort of a couple findings. One is if you get less sleep as a leader, that's going to predict less sleep for your direct reports. Yeah. Uh, not only that, but your the your charisma is going to be rated lower. The amount of abuse that happens in a position of management is increased under higher sleep debt. You know, uh, your ability to to problem solve, seek different perspectives, supporting others. You know, this is something that Chris Barnes and his colleagues over at University of Washington. This is sort of all they do. And I mean, it is just fascinating uh, work to see how sleep is affecting you know literally every fiber of the organization. And again, it makes sense. Your people are the organization. And so what affects your people? And then you start to list, make a list of those things. And I think it's just real, you know, literally until recently that we've been measuring it and, and have the sophistication to be able to do it at scale. And it's just fascinating to see the impacts it can have to a business. As a team leader or an organizational leader, other than... Um you know, getting more sleep yourself, <laughs> yeah. if that's what you need to do, how, how do we help others? You know, how do yeah. our team and our organizations, how do we get them to, to focus more on their sleep? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I mean, I'll just share what we've done. And, I, you know, I think obviously this is sort of also a study and organizational change and management, but mm-hmm. um, what we've done at Rise, we've, we're, we're sort of on the maturity scale. We are like as mature as you can get in terms of, you know, sleep. We literally have a tool in our Slack where I can see everyone's where they are in their energy schedule and how much sleep debt they have. Not the exact, I don't see how much they sleep. I don't see what time they went to bed and woke up, but I know, you know, uh, that our head of product, I might have some feedback for him. That's maybe hard because of the way I felt after a meeting, but he's got a lot of sleep debt and, you know, he's in his energy dip. So probably not the best time to Slack him to talk about, you know, giving him a really hard piece of feedback. Um, and instead engage him to, to get on the phone and say, Hey, how are you doing? Like, I see that you're, you know, you've way more sleep debt than you usually do. Like, how have you been doing? And that just that simple opening and, and framework has allowed people to really share, get to be much more human, much more quickly. And so, you know, and then I'll, we'll talk about it. Oh, I had a terrible night last night. I was restless. And here's why I was restless. I was thinking about all of these things that are stressing me out. And it allows you to be much more human at work. And, yeah. you know, even to the point where, if you're really high sleep debt, like we expect you to go take a nap. And if you need to go miss a meeting, like I I feel like you're letting the team down, right? If you haven't taken care of your sleep debt and you're not working the right part of your circadian rhythm. And I feel like I've let someone down if my sleep debt's way higher than it should be because I know I'm not my best self. So I think it just comes from a, you know, hopefully being able to talk about this information, open it up um, and be open about, you know, the impacts and that as a leader that you are supportive of people um, taking care of their sleep primarily because of how important it is for how they show up, not just at work, but equally at home. And, you know, that it's this, again, it's this foundational uh, sort of cascading effect that, you know, imagine your sleep debt's really high and works hard. Well, now it's much harder to work, mediate the work stress. And now you're more stressed out from work. And now you're going back to home and having, you know, worse conversations there and more conflict. And now you're more stressed out at home and now it makes work harder to, 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 to do. So, and all of this is what actually, if you look at what predicts burnout, it's actually sleep debt is the main factor. And it's, you know, kind of no surprise why once you start thinking about it in this way. So how do you overcome, um, you know, obviously you're a sleep company, right? And so talking yep. about or, or sharing data on your, your sleep debt um, is core to who you are. But what about other organizations? There has to be kind of a, a, a culture of trust and, and psychological safety in order for, you know, I, you know, for me to want my leader to know what my sleep debt is. I mean, what if I yeah. have a high sleep debt and I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to be judged based on that. Exactly. Right? I, or there's a fear that, you know, that somehow it'll, affect their view of my performance, you know, and it, you know, I mean, it, it's true, right? If, we're, if we have a high sleep debt, our performance <laughs> probably isn't that great, but we don't want to be judged, you know, on that. So how do we overcome that? Mm-hmm. It's a great question. I think, you know, so on the maturity sort of uh, scale, yeah. obviously we are on like the 
bleeding edge of, right. <laughs> of our sort of maturity around the topic as a company. And I would expect you guys to talk about <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what yeah, you exactly. <laughs> Right. And, and hopefully we are and all of that. But I would say the place to start that we've seen, um, you know, a lot of Fortune 500 companies doing, like the ones that we've worked with, is talking about it and bringing, making it part of how you do education. So for yeah. example, like it's not uncommon, you know, Google would bring in Matt Walker or, you know, folks would have us come in to speak or start to normalize it and talk about it. And that's just, that's, I think where it starts. And then I think it can come into one-on-ones pretty easily and, and seamlessly just say like, Hey, how are you doing? How are you sleeping? How are you eating? How are you the person doing before just jumping straight into business? Um, but what we find, which I think you'll find fascinating, is the moment a leader brings us in to talk about sleep, like everyone wants to talk about it and everyone has some experience with sleep and everyone wants to, you know, figure out what they can do. And it becomes this sort of universal bonding moment for leadership and, and everyone in the company to say, hey, we are prioritizing you as people. And, you know, not every organization uh, has those, you know, v- you know, those values in place. But when an organization does... Um, what we find is that, you know, uh, when you bring up this topic, it's just so well received. So um, that's I, really, you know, where where we think the world is going. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I echo that. I mean, so many of, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of fun to watch in a way. Number one, you know, one of my people that know me well know that um, I will, I don't ask people how they're doing. I ask people how they're sleeping. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. and for, I mean, for a period of time, fun. actually, my my signature and my email, my sign off was sleep well, um, wow. which was a little bit of a social experiment to see how many people commented it, commented on it or, or pointed it out. Wait, what was the learning? I'm curious to know, what did you, what, what were people like, what's, what are you doing, Jen? I mean, what sure. was the response from like- It was actually funny because- a, a lot of people like noticed it and, and made a, a comment back, you know, like some of them were really funny. I, the one that, that is most memorable was um, I had sent the email at like, you know, 10 AM and um, you know, the person, the person read it and she's like, I read it. And then she's like, I got really confused because I was like, wait, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Why is she telling me to sleep? Well, That's so funny. That's so <laughs> you know, funny. so um, yeah. So, I mean, it did get a lot of attention and kind of generated some fun conversation, but I mean, I feel like everyone these days is wearing some sort of wearable that tracks their sleep. And I see so many people comparing. So I think you're, you know, you're right in that, you know, it opens up a, a, you know, a a different conversation, a very human conversation. And I think that, you know, there is a real um, realization and and recognition that, you know, we are, we are all feeling sleep deprived, (laughs) especially these days. Right. And so I love that recommendation and and that suggestion. Um, And I do find that when we as leaders and as colleagues are willing to share, you know, how we're doing, what's working and what's not working, um, that, you know, the, 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 the fear of kind of sharing that information is certainly, um, is certainly lessened. Yeah, uh, no, I I agree. And it's something that, um, you know, especially where there, where there's already distrust of leadership, I probably wouldn't go tackle sleep first, but when leadership and management and, you know, everyone is you know on the same page, everyone's bought into the mission, vision, and values, like, you know, everyone's working towards the same set of common goals. It, it bringing up this topic tends to have outsized impact and just, I, I believe should be a, you know, uh, kind of first up priority for every modern team today because of just how deeply it affects, you know, the work we all do and how we show up as people. Um, and this wasn't always the case, you know. I think five years ago, even it was sort of a it was a badge of honor to be exhausted, and that was the way you're supposed to do it. And that's what it, it meant, you know. You're a hard worker if you're uh, getting four hours a night. You know that was a, a status symbol. And I think today people are realizing. I mean, Jen, you've certainly changed all of your behavior, but people today realize, well, that's just not how I want to live. Yeah. You know, like I, I, why do I want to live that way? It's not. It doesn't feel very good. It's not uh, fulfilling, and so. Um, it's exciting now that we are seeing a, a very strong change there. I, I have one final question for you. Sure. How do you, how do you personally manage sleep in your life? What does that look like? Yeah. So I will give uh, maybe three practical, very practical, tactical tips that you can take on. You know, immediately after this. So 
you know, obviously sleep debt and circadian rhythms are central. I use the Rise app to obviously measure these things and keep on track of it and integrate it into my calendar and all of this sort of stuff. So, you know, obviously I use that as a tool, but you don't need to, if you want, you can start a trial, you know, for free and see if it's something you're interested in. But for those of you that don't want any technology, you don't need it. Um, I'll tell you what I do. One is, you know, awareness that it's sleep debt that's driving how you feel. It's not something called sleep quality. It's not your deeper REM sleep. It's, it's, it doesn't have to do with that. It has to do with how much sleep debt you have. Um, and then the second is being mindful of your circadian rhythms. Now, again, getting like a precise understanding of this now it's changing every day is very hard without, you know, a lot of technology, but you know, that's really what we help make easier. But without that, you can still roughly know that, Hey, the first 90 minutes, you're going to be groggy. Then at some point you're going to have a peak of energy, you know, in that morning period, you're gonna have a dip of energy. So you can start to be more aware of that, of that's how, you know, we all work as humans and that then you can start to plan your day accordingly. So that obviously is sort of the foundation. Then I'd say a couple things that I do just routine wise. So, you know, we talked about this concept of naturalistic sleep. So I try and get out of the way, you know, what does that, what does getting out of the way mean? Well, cool, dark, and quiet. So, you know, cool means like, you know, you don't need to obsess about the temperature, but it should be roughly cool in your room. It should be dark enough that when the sun comes up, you can't tell. And it should be quiet. You know, I live near a freeway right now. And so I can hear the cars running by, but I sleep with earplugs every night because I know that 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 higher level of noise is actually creating a sort of non-natural sleep environment. And so it's going to sort of change the sleep that I would normally get. And we don't know exactly what that does, but we just know that it's non-normal sleep, non-natural sleep. So um, cool, dark, quiet. Once you've nailed cool, dark, and quiet, then I would say, um, you know, one major thing to focus on that I've taken very seriously is my wind down routine. And I know this is sort of also like tends to be a fuzzy concept for people, but there is um, significant science around this concept of trying to putting yourself into a sort of relaxing state before bed can have big impacts on falling asleep and staying asleep. So for example, last night, no surprise, I was up in the middle of the night, I was working in, right until my wind down. I, I didn't do my wind down appropriately. And that for me is usually predictive that I'm going to be up in the middle of the night. So my, what my wind down looks like is about an hour and a half before bed, um, I'm putting on these orange glasses, they block out blue light. Again, that's so that the light that I'd normally be getting is, you know, uh, from, you know, your blue light comes from every light source, not just your screen. And anytime your brain gets blue light, it'll actually reduce the amount of melatonin that you produce. Uh, And so I put on these orange glasses an hour and a half before bed. So I'm showering with them. I'm, uh, you know, winding down with them. And the way that I think about my wind down and and really that that you can think about is you want to put your most, you know, stressful or unenjoyable tasks as early as possible into your wind down. So let's say I have to like do the dishes or I've got to look at mail or I've got to do like things I don't want to do. I put that right at the beginning. I throw more orange glasses on, get that stuff done. And then I reserve the back half for things that I just really love. Like maybe it's a Netflix show that I'm really getting excited about or a book that I'm reading or a podcast I'm listening to. Um, So for me, it's a combination of something like that. Um, Plus, I will do uh, either a hot shower or hot bath. Yeah. And the hot water, uh, there's actually some pretty decent science around being under hot water, not necessarily for like, you know, cleaning purposes, but just heating up your body before bed actually increases your core body temperature. And then when you get out of that hot water, your body temperature, core body temperature decreases, which lets you sort of fall asleep a little bit faster and have, you know, a uh, sort of more efficient time. Uh, in bed. So the time that you're in bed, you're actually sleeping for a higher percentage of it. So it's, you know, it's just something I find both scientifically interesting, but also just very, very relaxing personally. And I do it almost, you know, every night. So that's, but everyone can design their own wind down. But I would just say, you know, roughly think about an hour and a half, orange glasses are a must, I can, you know, Jen, send you the link to to the ones that we would recommend. Uh, They're like, you know, $10 on Amazon, and then cool, dark, quiet. And I think if you do those things, plus you understand sleep debt, circadian rhythm, you're getting the main benefit uh, that sleep has to offer in your life. And then you can start focusing once you've mastered that on you know, all these other areas of well-being. So uh, that's you know how I think about it and how I try and practice it. I, I absolutely love that. I'm a big believer and practicer of bedtime rituals. I tell people to pretend like they're six years old. So 
Yeah. I think that, you know, like the, the, the bedtime Absolutely. routine, right? Your parents tell you go brush your teeth and, and take a, you know, take a bath and brush your teeth. When you're six years old, you don't like brushing your teeth or taking a bath necessarily. So those are the unenjoyable right. things, perhaps. I prefer the beginning of the wind down. <laughs> right. And then, you know, you get in bed and, and one of your parents reads you a bedtime story. That's the enjoyable part, right? So that's, yeah. that's the new. So I love it. It, it, it tracks. So just yeah. pretend like you're six. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, you know, it's, it is sim- Once you understand it, it's simple. And I think that, um, you know, hopefully this stuff is clarifying and um, we've got a bunch of it up on our website and a sleep guide that we, everything I've just talked about, we try and link to the peer reviewed research and um, you know, our, our team does a great job just trying to get as much of this knowledge out there for consumption so that, um, you know, you really can invest your time, your money, your focus into the areas that are going to affect you the most. Yeah, for sure. This has been great, Jeff. Thank you so much. So, I mean, just a wealth of information. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and I know that our listeners are going to take a lot away from it. So thank you again for being on the show. Yeah, anytime. I'm so grateful Jeff could be with us today to talk about the vital role of sleep to our well-being. Also, check out my forthcoming book, Work Better Together, available now for pre-order on Amazon. Thank you to our producers and our listeners. You can find the WorkWell podcast series on Deloitte.com, or you can visit various podcatchers using the keyword WorkWell, all one word, to hear more. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe so you get all of our future episodes. If you have a topic you'd like to hear on the Work Well podcast series, or maybe a story you would like to share, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. My profile is under the name Jen Fisher or on Twitter at JenFish23. We're always open to your recommendations and feedback. And of course, if you like what you hear, please share, post, and like this podcast. Thank you and be well. Be well.